Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this weekly program. And tonight's guest is Sarang Hanap. Sarang, uh, you can tell by the name, uh, comes from a different culture. And his journey though, which I find very fascinating, uh, in, many words, in many ways parallels that yet of many American Catholics or other Christians who are brought up in their faith but maybe in the process don't learn the faith very well and as a result as they get older don't understand it very well but yet then are also open for the work of God in their life. Sarang is a convert to the church from Hinduism and I know a number of you from emails we've, we've uh, received have had questions about Eastern religions and this would be a good night to ask some of those questions. Our theme for tonight though is eternal life and it fits so well as Sarang described his journey to me earlier uh, as he looks, looked at the fact that even though the idea of eternal life is common amongst so many different religions of the world that the understanding of what eternal life is, how one attains it, or whether one can lose eternal life, the different ideas about the relationship between our sin and eternal life differ, of course, from one religion to the next. And that was a part of Sarang's journey into the Catholic Church. So if you have any questions about uh, his journey, remember your uh, phone calls are an important part of our program. So you might want to call us at 1-800-221-9460 or send us a, an email at journeyhome at EWTN.com. Sarang, welcome to the Journey Home. It's blessing to be here. I think you're the first convert from Hinduism to the Catholic Church that I've had on the Journey Home program. Do you know very many converts yourself from Hinduism to the Church? Uh, not in this country. I know converts uh, from Hinduism back home in India. Yeah. I haven't met any converts from Hinduism in this country, though. Not all that yeah. common. Then, is That's, it? Right. Uh, that's right. That's right. Now, how long ago was it that you uh, came into this country? I came into this country in 1976. Okay. To go to school. To go to school. That's right. All right. Well, we usually begin each week by asking the guests to give us a little bit of a background. So why don't we begin there tonight? Uh, I came here in 1976 and went to USC. And uh, in about a year's time, I met my with my wife, All right. my partner for eternal life, <laughs> um, and we got married in a civil ceremony. All right. Um, and uh, you know, that time, my wife was a fallen away Catholic. All right. um, I was practicing Hinduism uh, at that time. You were brought up, of course, in India. That's right. Did you receive the, let's say, the normal uh, training as a young uh, Indian in the Hindu faith? Oh uh, well, uh, religion is not a subject taught in the school in India, hmm. nor is religion taught as a subject at home by the parents. Hmm. Uh, we, uh, we had teaching about the good morals hmm. from the childhood. Right. So you had ethical and moral teaching. That's right. What about, a, what would you call the Hindu church or what, what was it called, Hindu it temple? A Hindu temple. All right, would there be teaching there like comparable to what we have no. here? No, nothing no. like that. There's no teaching as such, no. Okay. No. So it's possible for a person to be brought up in India, brought up in Hinduism, but actually never learn the faith That's very right. well? That's right. But you learn a, a piety, a practice? Uh, because you're taught morals, you're taught uh, the, the commandments. Yeah. However, you're not taught the consequences of sin and All right. turning away from God. I think usually when, when Americans think of Hinduism, they think of meditation. It, was that the kind of a faith you were taught as a young man? Uh, not taught as such. Uh, when I was about uh, 22 years old, my father gave me a booklet that had prayers to an Indian deity, hmm. uh, how uh, a, a proud king rebelled against that deity and how that deity brought him to his knees. Hmm. And you, you, you read that book throughout the week and you complete, completed reading that prayer booklet at the end of the week, on, actually on a Saturday. Yeah, okay. But uh, that, that was the extent of it. Is that right? That's right. Now in Hinduism, are there a variety of gods or is there just one? Yes, deity? yes. Okay. Uh, uh, I mean, there is uh, Vishnu and there's Brahma and there's Krishna. Okay. Those are the main gods. All right. um, 
So it's quite a bit different than our. That's right. It's not really a parallel to, to Christianity no. in any way. No. At all. Okay. Wanted to make sure no. for the audience sake on that. So you you came to the states for schooling and you met That's your right. wife and who were you say was a falling away Catholic right. and, and really had no you had a, a, a civil marriage right and no real plans to become Catholic. That's right. At that time. We picked as our theme eternal life, and it connected with how you were taught as a Hindu. What did you think about eternal life before your Christian phase began? Uh, in Hinduism, we um, uh, believed that there were seven lives that person could reincarnate and uh, take on a different life, maybe the life of an animal, the life of some of another being, or maybe one as a human being, but that the person lived seven lives, so lived seven lives before going to its final destination. Mm -hmm. And that final destination, depending upon uh, how meritorious you had lived those lives, uh, okay. would be heaven. Were you taught, uh, again, you weren't taught in, in school, and it's about, let's say through your parents' modeling, uh, was there a relationship between sin and where you would end up? Was there a heaven and a hell? Well, oh, we spoke about hell. And when we spoke about hell, we knew that there were demons and that there was Satan in hell. But we never really spoke about human souls hmm. being condemned to hell and for eternity and never returning from there. Hmm. That teaching was not they are at Hinduism. It essentially, and again, you're not a, the, a Hindu theologian. That's right. And you weren't taught in detail. It may, in fact, have been more theologically explained right. within uh, Hinduism in that sense. But as far as you were taught, essentially there were seven stages you went through, seven different lives, and you ended up in whatever you would call it afterwards, right. regardless of how you lived in this life. You might, how you live might determine what kind of one of those seven lives you live, but it didn't affect where you're going to go in the end, right? That's right. Okay. That's right. All right. All right, then. What, uh, with all of that, uh, well, one, one question. Uh, in a Hindu standpoint, Hindu way of understanding, did you see the need of a savior? Uh, in Hinduism, I did not see the need of a savior, no. I didn't even know that a savior existed. Okay. Hinduism is basically living a good life. Good life. It's more of a lifestyle than a religion as such. Hinduism is more of a lifestyle as I understand it. All right. Well, in being brought up in India, did you have any introduction to Christianity at all? Uh, yes. Uh, my, uh, when I was in the fifth grade, the movie Ten Commandments came out in its colored version. <laughs> and I had seen posters of Moses standing with the two tablets and the Red Sea split. <laughs> and I told my mom about those posters. And I told her I wanted to see that movie. And my mom took me to see the Ten Commandments and explained the movie to me. <laughs> How was so, it viewed by your mother and others? Did they see it as a movie? Or well, they? Uh, they, uh, the, the, the audience would see a movie like that more for, uh, more for the sake of uh, colored version and how the movies are made and what you see on a silver screen. Uh, not necessarily as a, uh, as a religious theme. So that introduced you to the Judeo-Christian. Judeo That's right. What about Christ himself? Christ himself I saw uh, in a couple of uh, movies, I saw the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. Okay. Ben-Hur or something Ben-Hur, like right. Oh, okay, things right. like that. Right. But never, really, never touched by a missionary? No. Uh, in fact, uh, my father uh, was very picky about missionaries. If, if he knew that there was, there was a missionary around in that area, he would warn me, make sure you don't go to that missionary because he's going to turn you, he's going to make a convert out of your Christianity. All right. So you, there's a sense in which you have a little bit of a bent <coughs> right. away. Right. All right. Well, then what opens your heart to the, to to the Jesus, Christianity and the, the church? Christianity. Yeah. Uh, I suppose first to Jesus. Yeah. After we got married, uh, uh, there were times when my wife felt the need to go to church visits. She could not receive communion those days, but she felt the need to go and visit and sit there and pray. And 
that's how I started going with her because I used to take her. And uh, later on, I started going inside and I saw the crucified Jesus whom I had seen in, in those couple of movies that we talked about. And I saw the baptismal font and I saw uh, the statues of angels and saints. And that's where I felt the difference. This is different than what I've seen in Hindu temples. Mm. This, is, this is peace. Mm. This is mm. peace. This is the fountain of peace. And that, that attracted me. I started waiting inside the church with her later on, <laughs> instead of waiting for her outside. <laughs> Were you still practicing your Hinduism? During That's that? right, I was still practicing Hinduism. Okay. So, <laughs> how long did this part of your process, I mean, you, you certainly didn't become a Christian immediately, but at least, That's right. at least your heart was softened a That's bit. Right. That's so right. So, how did that develop from that point? Uh, when we lived in Columbus, Ohio, we started attending Spanish Mass, more from a s social standpoint. Yeah. Because your wife. That's right. And that's how I got interested. I got, I got interested in singing in Spanish with her. Uh, and since we realized that our common language, you see, I don't speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. Since we realized that our common language is English, I thought maybe we should start attending English Masses. Mm -hmm. And I bought my first Catholic Bible back in 82. And I started reading it. Okay. And I started attending Mass at St. James Parish in Columbus, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And one Sunday, one out of the four ushers was missing. And the main usher asked me to help collect, do collections. <laughs> and that got me st interested in doing collections for them. Mm. The next Sunday, the other usher was back and they didn't need me. And I, I felt that I was missing something. <laughs> and I got myself um, into ushering. I told them, make me an usher. And that continued. So admiring the crucified Jesus, ushering, Being singing, in sure. singing in the church, that, 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 those were the first seeds planted by the Holy Spirit in my life. I was still practicing Hinduism on the side? At that time I was, yes. That's right, okay, yes. not really a Catholic yet or a Christian yet, but being drawn That's by, right, I was drawn by, by Christ. Family. All right, okay. now, that's when you were in Columbus. That's right. Then you made a, a, a journey to a very Catholic spot in America. That's right. right. Uh, moved across the country because of business reasons. Um, and we wanted to move back to, Midwest, to, to the Midwest again. And uh, we didn't plan to move to South Bend. But it was in God's plan, <laughs> you know, uh, to move us to such a Catholic community uh, where Notre Dame is located. Mm -hmm. And it was in March of 88 that we moved back to South Bend. And my wife met, uh, through her family connections, a devout Catholic uh, by the name of Isabel Jacob. And um, she used to go to uh, the charismatic prayer meetings uh, at a locked chapel at Notre Dame. And my wife went there and she, was, she got filled with the Holy Spirit. And she asked me to start going. And I went. <clears throat> and the most interesting thing about these meetings is that there is a meeting in the first hour which is followed by the Eucharist, mm. which is not very common. Mm. And there I got more interested in singing, <clears throat> in seeing people having the gifts of prophecy people quoting scripture from their memory, mm. and most of all, people talking about Jesus and Mary with a confidence in their mind, mm. Mm. you know, and people receiving the body and blood of Christ. Uh -huh. I saw the expre expressions on their face. There's so much peace and devotion. So, so this is drawing you even more into This is drawing me even more to Catholicism. What was it that, what was another uh, key stone, that, uh, a key place that got you to make a decision to make a step towards? Because at this point you're still hanging on to your Hin right. Hindu background. Um, there were a couple of instruments of God. First of all, the leader of the prayer meetings, Father Edward Connor, who is a great Marian theologian at Notre Dame. His homilies 
uh, about the eternal life, his homilies. He mentioned the apparitions of Our Lady in Fatima a couple of times and the three children being given the vision of hell and the reality of hell that those who die in mortal sin with no repentance, those souls do go to hell. And those who die in state of grace, following God's commandments, go to heaven. His homilies were really a turning point. Uh, Sister Julie, who was my sponsor at my baptism, she was a devout, she's a devout Catholic. Uh, daily communicant, no scripture by heart, and uh, loves Jesus and loves the Blessed Mother. I was seeing in these people, in this Catholic community, <clears throat> their devotion to Jesus, receiving the Eucharist, and the virtues of faith, hope, and charity flowing because of the confidence that they had in Jesus as their savior. You were getting the, the, uh, the balanced witness That's right. of the way our, we should evangelize both with the word and with their lives. That's right. right. They were, they were, you were seeing uh, the unity of their uh, words and their lives. That's right. Uh, all right, well, you're still there. You're getting closer and closer. That's right. All right. Getting closer and closer. Um, then the people in our community See, we wanted to have a child, and our friends prayed for us to have a child, and we got the news that my wife had conceived, mm -hmm. and the time came close when she delivered our son, and that time the question came, well, what are we going to name him? <laughs> um, and we decided to baptize him in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. and. That's when we had started going uh, for instruction in getting married in the church. So he was baptized in the Catholic Church. We got married in the Catholic Church. And my wife started receiving communion. <laughs> and I was, I wanted the confidence and peace that these people had. But I was still hung up with some of my Hindu deities because I used to have their pictures and their statues at home. And I used to still pray to Hindu deities. Um, so there was one evening, now this is again in God's plan. This was an evening in August, a stormy evening, when Sister Julie was sitting at the dinner table with me. And my wife, and my, my wife was trying to put my son to sleep in the other room, mm -hmm. since it was a stormy evening. And Sister had, had, she had, she had actually admonished me a couple of times that I used to pray to those Hindu deities. And she asked me the key questions. She was seeing that I, I didn't really want to remain in Hinduism. Yeah. She asked me the key, key question. Well, are you going to do it? <laughs> and I decided, I told her, yes, I want to become Catholic. <laughs> and that was approved by God because that stormy evening really gave thunder showers, a thunderstorms, and a hailstorm. <laughs> you know. And later on that evening, I made that announcement also at the Lock Chapel hmm. before the Eucharist, before Father was coming out to Mass, hmm. that I had decided to become Catholic. And the timing was so good; it was in God's plan in such a way that. The RCIA starts in September, and I made my decision in August, so it was, it was perfect timing, you know. <laughs> was your IC, RCIA experience a good one for you? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Because many in our audience probably have never been through our, through our CIA, uh, the, uh, the right for uh, Christian, initiation. Christian initiation for adults. adults. Right. That's right. And basically, there you're, you're given the, the not only the basic teachings of the church, but Introduction in liturgical life That's right. and uh, the community of the That's church. Right. And uh, so that Easter, Easter when, 1990? It was Easter 1991 All right. that I was baptized and received the three sacraments. All right. Now as a Catholic, we've, we've looked at our theme, eternal life, and so much of what you've described that you were discovering, so much of which we take for granted. Right. Because uh, so many of us born in America, 
Catholic backgrounds or even Protestant backgrounds uh, are completely familiar with a lot of stuff that to you was right was so different. The baptism of found, I mean, just in that sense. But now looking back as a Catholic, describe now how you understand eternal life from a Catholic perspective. Okay, eternal life is the fact that after death there is another life that there is resurrection of the dead. Mm -hmm. And we know that from the gospel, from the scriptures, mm -hmm. the resurrection of Christ, and that there is a resurrection of the dead after, the, after we die. You know, I mean, the soul will resurrect now, our bodies will be joined to the soul later on mm -hmm. when there is, uh, after the final judgment. Uh, and that there is life with God which is everlasting, will see God face to face, like St. Paul says. Mm -hmm. For now I see in mirror, but later on I'll see face to face. And that is eternal life. We'll have the company of the Blessed Mother and the angels and saints. Mm -hmm. And there is a dwelling which Jesus describes in John 14, 2. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places, and one of that dwelling will be ours mm -hmm. for eternity. How does that, again, now, doing this partially for those maybe who are watching or aren't really familiar with the Christian teaching on uh, salvation, how then is our life in this side of death connected to our life on the other side of death? Um, because if we live this life meritoriously, follow the commandments of God, follow the Beatitudes and live in the grace of God, then we have the gift of salvation. Mm -hmm. Now, if we, right, I'm sorry. if we don't, if we turn away from God and live in mortal sin, that's our own choice and we condemn, condemn ourselves to hell. So we have to live this life in God's grace and follow His commandments. All right. Let me ask kind of a, what, they, what someone called devil's advocate question. You, okay. Uh, some might say that sounds like a works righteousness. That sounds like it, uh, it's how good we are, or how bad we are determines where we're going to go in the next life. Well, why do I need Jesus then if it's just me, me being good or bad? Well, how does Jesus fit into that formula for our call to be in grace and in righteousness? Well, oh, Jesus has given us the teaching about eternal life in the gospel. And we know that, we know from the gospel and from the Acts that Jesus is the only Savior. Mm -hmm. There is no Savior to humanity other than Jesus Christ, as we know from the Acts of the Apostles. Right. You know. So salvation is through Christ only. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure we clarify it because I know that I know from where I came from that we often only heard when Catholics described the need to be in grace as a Protestant, I always heard them saying, hearing them teach a works righteousness, but not hearing that Catholics teach one that we're saved only by grace, and that's the grace of Jesus that, uh, that he won for us on the cross, experiencing his divine life, and that's the sharing of eternal life. Even as we speak, we experience eternal life. Uh, but we are called in faith to accept that, right? And, but that faith is more than mental assent to what we might believe about Jesus, that faith means living it, too. It's That's a, right. It's obedience. That's right. And the beauty of it, Scripture teaches in Romans 8, is that it's in our living in the Spirit that we're enabled by grace to surrender to Christ, to surrender uh, our sinfulness, and to, to grow in holiness. Again, it's all grace. Right, in that sense. Was there, was there an aspect of grace in Hinduism? Oh, uh, there was an aspect of grace. I mean, there were people who lived life full of merit mm -hmm. and who frequented going to the temples and uh, lived in the fear of God. Uh, my grandmother, for example, uh, she used to go to the temple every day and uh, she used to pray every day. And she really had that 
love of God in her heart, you know, and she used to love the neighbors and uh, love her family. So, yes, there was that aspect of grace. That in speaks life. to that spark of, that, that St. Augustine talks about, right. uh, that God-shaped void, uh, right. or that idea of, of, uh, of our hearts are, are restless until they find their rest in thee, right. St. Augustine. So that's in all people, and in a Absolutely. sense, on the one hand, all religions are a search to fill that emptiness, that's right. And then, of course, our call on the Catholic uh, faith is to help them see the fullness of the grace that they can have in sure. Christ, in the midst of that Savior. How has your family responded to your, your coming to the church? Well, it was a blessing for my wife because sure. yeah. I could go to Mass with her and receive the sacraments, receive the body and blood of Christ. So it was a blessing for her. Yeah. And uh, But my... Uh, Parents in India didn't react. In the beginning, uh, their reaction was not what I expected it to be. Uh, um, I, ex I thought that they would react positively, but they did not. Yeah. Uh, my mom, in fact, uh, 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 during her first trip after my conversion, uh, she was angry at me mm -hmm. that I had converted to Christianity. But as the time went on, as she came to visit us more and more, she started accepting it. She saw uh, the movie, uh, the, the Miracle of Our Lady of Fatima, and she saw that we were doing the rosary, <laughs> I and the children and my wife, and gradually she accepted it. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to take a break in, in just a second. I'm, I was wondering, uh, another parallel we see lots of parallels in different faiths, and you, you said in, in Hinduism there you had statues, and you find it Catholicism right. a statue. Might want to be good to explain the difference and how the different faiths. Well, in Hinduism, when you are praying to the statues, you you're thinking that that statue is God, is the deity, is, is the deity. Whereas in Catholicism, a uh, statue is not the deity. That's only an instrument that gives you probably the initiation yeah. to pray to God who's invisible in this life. Yeah. It draws your attention. That's right. If you're looking at the statue of a saint, That's it right. reminds you of That's the right. virtues of that saint, draws That's you right. past the statue That's to right. or, or a statue of our, our Lady, a picture of Jesus. That's right. Um, all these things are to, like a picture of a person in a family. Absolutely. I mean, that's really what it is. And, uh, a picture of, of a beloved member of your family will will touch your heart. Absolutely. That's what they do, to draw us to our devotion. Yeah. But not to be... And that, is that a, I was wondering, you, you said earlier that you, you knew very few Hindus who converted. What, what is the, the, the biggest stumbling block? Well, um, the biggest stumbling block back in India would be uh, maybe there are not that many... Uh, good missionaries uh, right. out there, that, that would be one. Um, and the religious teaching is not there, okay. you know, at schools. That I mean, sadly, you could say that part of the right. reason why there aren't more converts is that we don't have enough of us Catholics going out to, that, to Hindus that's and right. sharing the that's faith. Right. Uh, right. We, would you say that maybe a lot of Catholics are a little nervous and think that a Hindu wouldn't be interested in hearing? That's or, right. That's right. Uh, and so we, we stop ourselves before we even start. So maybe this should be an encouragement for us right. to, uh, so to not let anything stand in the way, but right. share the faith, especially with such a high number of, of immigrants in the church now from Eastern religions. Many of those like yourself, would you say That's that right. maybe for Hindus in name only? Hindus in name only, right. Many right. of those. Right. And right. didn't really have a complete understanding of what eternal life or life in God is about. All right. Well, we're going to take a break. We'll be back okay. in just a moment with your questions for Sarang Hanap. Again, the, the phone number is 1-800-221-9460. We'll see you in a bit.
Welcome back to The Journey Home. My guest this evening, Sarang Hanap, has been sharing with us his journey uh, from Hinduism into the Catholic faith. And I mentioned at the beginning of the story that, that what I consider an interesting aspect to your journey is the parallel with uh, many who are just brought up in the Catholic Church or brought up in, let's say, another tradition more as a cultural Catholic or a cultural Lutheran right. or a cultural Presbyterian um, who don't learn their faith for one reason or another. Uh, yet, because that's who... Did you understand yourself as a Hindu? You know what I'm saying? Would you, if someone would ask you, you would have said you're an Indian? Or would you have said you're Hindu? I would say I'm an Indian. Okay. Yes. Who is Hindu by faith? Hindu or was, by faith. Uh, yes. Okay. That's right. All right. Uh, in fact, one way we describe it uh, is, uh, is Jesus, for many nominals, Jesus is just one of many things in a person's life. They love Jesus, but they love soccer, and they love bowling, or they right. love shopping, or they love you know, ice cream. Okay, well, Jesus is one of many things. But then when you come to a commitment to Christ, no, you love Jesus. That's right. Everything else is lesser. That's right. Uh, for you as an Indian, would Hinduism just been a, one of many aspects of you, or was it an important part of who you were? It was not an important part of uh, who I was. Hin uh, is more, Hinduism, is, as I uh, explained earlier, uh, is, is more, or more of a lifestyle. Uh -huh than uh, a religion as such. Would you say it's common amongst most Indians? Yes, absolutely. Right. Very interesting. Absolutely. Very interesting. So a small percentage of the Hindus, Indian Hindus, are, are very fanatic about or very committed to their faith. It's a lesser percent. That's right. Okay. Very interesting. All right. Let's take our first email. This is from Tom Larson in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. He asks, what is the Hindu view on abortion? Do they view it as the grave sin of murder? as Christians should view it? Um, unfortunately, uh, abortion is allowed in, Indi in India. Mm -hmm. That's the unfortunate thing about it. Uh, has and it been allowed for a long time? Or? As far as I know, yes. Okay. Um, and they have the problem of population. So people don't really see that as a sin. Uh, against that, we in Catholicism, uh, we know that only God can give the life and take that life away. And we do not have the right to commit abortion. So you would see that this is connected, um, it c connects with their, the lack of recognizing a connection between uh, how they live in this life and where they're going to go That's in right. eternity. That's right. Uh, so it wouldn't matter whether they saw it as murder or not. The point is that their particular understanding of their faith is that it didn't have any connection. That's right. To eternity. Absolutely. So they end up leaning on the practicality of things. That's right. Given the reality of, That's right. of population explosion, That's it, it's right. just justified. That's right. Sadly, you know, and it's just a sad commentary. That's right. On the culture, um, I'm wondering if that affects other their decisions about about way they treat people in their culture. That's possible too. I, mean, I don't know a lot about the caste system, and I know you that wasn't a part of your right. experience of India, India, but I'm wondering if that's kind of the same connection. I mean, if you could be so open to treating different people at different levels and you know, kind of locking them in to a certain level of uh, existence. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's without right. feeling the need, as Jesus taught, you know, to reach out. The, the way uh, committing abortion is not a sin as understood by most of the Hindu people because they don't make the connection yeah. of life and death and sin. Right. They, don't have, they, don't, they don't have the teaching. In the same way, caste system is another practicality. I mean, certain people are unfortunately born in poverty and they belong to a lower caste and certain people are, uh, have, certain people have money and you know, they belong to a higher caste. So that's just more of a practicality than yeah. anything else. All right. All right. And really, looking at our own history in America, we shouldn't point fingers. I mean, we don't That's have right. a, quote, caste system, but yet we have a very strong difference between the haves and the have-nots. Right. And we have a, a, a horrible history of the way the haves have often treated the have-nots in our own country. Let's take our first phone caller. This is Pat from New Jersey. What's your question for us tonight? Hello. Hello. Well, first of all, I've enjoyed your program, and I have waited close to a year for this program. Ha-ha, <laughs> Pat. Well, welcome. <laughs> 
because my son married a very lovely Hindu girl about a year and a half ago, and I just don't know how to reach them. They don't live yeah. close. I know I should be praying, and I do. And she is, she's a lovely girl, but I guess I'm always concerned that that for him, if he falls away from practicing the Catholic faith, then that's very serious. Yeah. And I'm just not sure like what I should be doing. Is he practicing? I think he is. Yeah. Um, does, does his um, wife they, visit with him at all? Or? I think I think she does. Okay. Uh, but they live they lived at distance from me, so I'm not sure. Sh- really sure. They they had it, two ceremonies. They had the Catholic ceremony because they got a special dispensation from the bishop in the area, and then they had a Hindu ceremony, which mm-hmm. was very beautiful, as a matter of fact. Yeah. But my concern is my son and his wife, and what's going to happen, right. and with them and their children. All right, Pat. Thank you. Thank you for waiting. Sorry, it's taking so long to get Sarang here to ask, answer your question. That's a very good question, and uh, I would say that he should continue to frequent the sacraments. Mm-hmm. Continue to frequent the sacraments. Keep going to church. Receive the body and blood of Christ. Go to confession as often as necessary and be a model to her. Hmm. So that's your advice to the the, the husband. That's right. What about to the mother that is at such a distance and any suggestions for her? Well, uh, for for her, maybe she could write to the daughter-in-law every now and then Hmm. or send her a rosary, send her a picture of of the Blessed Mother. You know, send us something like that. Okay. I was wondering, uh, given your background, um, <coughs> should this, should Pat, uh, should she assume that maybe this young woman's upbringing in Hinduism was similar to yours? That That's possible. That's always possible. Yes. So it may not be as strong. She as may not have a very strong uh, religious background or not. I don't know what the caller, what the caller told us a whole lot about right. her religious background right. or not. But uh, it's th- the possibility exists that she may not have a very strong religious background. She may not have the teaching of eternal life and eternal death. Right. So in a sense, don't be afraid to talk don't to her about it. Don't be afraid to talk. Um, That's right. And Absolutely. we do recognize that all truth is of God. That's right. All, if it's true, it's of God. of God. And there are aspects of all religions where there is some truth. Some have you know, a very Absolutely. small amount and others are closer to the fullness. But right. so looking for those areas where you can intersect and build on. Um, of course, uh, Pat, you mentioned the very, you know what you're supposed to be doing, and that's praying. That's and right. you mentioned that. I mean, that absolutely is the most important thing because all conversion comes about by the work of grace in, in someone's heart. So, But I think your witness in that it may be that this, is, maybe this uh, uh, young bride doesn't let on very much that she doesn't know her faith very well. That's right. That's, uh, that's possible that she... She may not be very open sure. to listening, but if you continue your efforts, um, as you said, pray for her and um, um, yeah. show her that Jesus is the only Savior. Show her that in you frequenting the sacraments, your son frequenting the sacraments, and living the virtues of this life, you know. And it also helps to recruit ambassadors, is to try and find someone else in that Absolutely. church where they are, in that area that can befriend them, befriend her, develop a relationship, because you were sharing that it really was through the witness yes. of those Absolutely. friends Absolutely. that you saw, you heard their faith and you saw their faith. Right. And so the more that you can instill that, Pat, that that, that would help. And we'll, of course, keep... Keep it in our prayers. Yeah, that's exactly right. Let's take this next email. It comes from Lauren in New Jersey. Coming from a religion and culture that is so very different from the Catholic faith must have been difficult, but I am curious specifically about your acceptance of the doctrine of the Trinity. Was the idea of a Trinitarian God difficult to see? Was there anything specific that helped the doctrine make sense to you? Um, Not really, because... um, uh, I didn't quite understand God in Hinduism as such. And uh, so coming from that background and going to the Mass and hearing about the Trinitarian God, who is actually 
uh, one God, mm -hmm. though three persons, but one God. Mm -hmm. That was not difficult for me to follow, no, right. no. So Would it have been more difficult if you had come as a strong polytheist, uh, one that was a strong Hinduism, that believed very deeply in all these different gods, would it have been more difficult to make the transition from many to three one. and one? Yes, okay. that would have been, yes. Okay, so maybe in your benefit... It that, wasn't my benefit, right. ...that you didn't come from a strong That's Hindu right. background, but that might make it a barrier for some then. It who, might. ...who come from, to get them to see that distinction, which right. actually historically was a problem in the early church too. We had right. the struggles with those that came from the polytheistic religions right. in to accept. Uh, but then that's why the church took the strong definition and said this is right. the truth. Right. Hold tight to it. Let's take our next phone call. Denny from Pennsylvania, what's your question for us tonight? Yes, my question was uh, when you uh, came to believe, I missed the very beginning of the show, when you came to believe in the one God, was it difficult for, for you to... Uh, make this transition from polytheism. Oh. All right, so it's, this is a little bit connected to the last one. What, what I was wondering is when you, when you connected with what Denny was saying, when you came into the, the faith, what about all those other little gods that you, did they linger at all in your, uh, your heart, your thought? They lingered, but I got attached to Jesus. <laughs> I was seeing the crucified Jesus and that crucified Jesus was in front of me all the time. Yeah. It's amazing in Scripture. Uh, you'll find it in uh, Galatians, you'll find it in Colossians. Uh, there's a number of places where Paul reminds the people to keep your eyes on oh, Jesus, Jesus, on the crucified Jesus, before whom, before you, his blood was... You know, we're reminding what he did on the cross. It doesn't mean we don't believe in the resurrection, of course we do, or, or Christianity That's wouldn't right. exist. But we also have to re always remember what he did for us on the cross. And that takes, when you have that as your focus, it takes away all these other That's little right. gods That's right. that try and infiltrate and distract us in our life. Let's take our next email from Lori, I think it's Lieb, from Ontario. I've noticed that it has become almost fashionable in certain circles to be a member of non-Christian religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, etc. Why do you think this is? Why do Americans get drawn to these Eastern religions? Um... That's, uh, that's a good question because they may not be uh, very good practicing uh, religious people in their faith. They may not have had the necessary religious teaching, whether they are uh, Protestants or Catholics or Jewish or any other faith. Um, they feel that there is more depth in some of these Oriental religions than there is in Christianity, and which is actually not the case. Yeah. The fullness of truth is in Christianity, as we understand. Yeah. And sadly, that's a commentary that's right. on maybe our failure to bring up our Catholic young people in their faith strong enough so that they can experience the fullness, experience that's right. the union with Christ. And instead, they might be brought up for one way, reason or another, uh, uh, as nominal cultural Catholics so they don't experience the beauty of the faith and then somebody else has a new package, right. a new wrapping, nice bow on it. W would you say that, that much of the Hinduism that Americans encounter is really an Americanized version of Hinduism? That's, that's, that's possible uh, because um, what they search for in, in Hinduism, uh, they think that they can find uh, the certain kind of depth, which is actually not there, and they try to maybe create that depth based upon their understanding of Hinduism. I'm wondering, as a Catholic, uh, you've been a Catholic now 10 years? Yes. What, you, you said, it's interesting that one of the first things that you were called upon to do was to be an usher that's right. Uh, long before you were Catholic, you right. really you're a practicing Hindu, but right. uh, in a sense you can see how the church can open up for opportunities for people to get close to things. But now as a Catholic 10 years, how have you been able to serve your Lord Jesus where you uh, live there in South Bend? Well, uh, I'm a Eucharistic minister. I continue to be usher, and I continue to 
read. I'm a lector at our parish. So I love to assist in the Mass. Mm -hmm. I love to show to my children mm -hmm. to frequent the sacraments. Yeah. Teach the children how important it is mm -hmm. to follow Jesus. How important it is to go to confession and to receive the body and blood of Christ in grace. And tell the children about the love of the Blessed Mother. All right, we'll try and get a couple more calls in. Here's a call from Paul in New York. What's your question for us? Hello, Paul. Hello. Hello, what's your question for us tonight? Thanks for taking my question and the comment. Yeah. I have a question for the guest, and I was a Hindu, and I am a convert. And uh, the question is, the uh, New Age is so much inroading into Hinduism, and uh, the so-called mind-body and things like that, and I want to know what's the guest thought on that. And the comment is, uh, I've seen a lot of people back home, they pray to all the gods, including Jesus and Mary, mm -hmm. so it should be easy to evangelize them. So uh, thanks for taking the call, and I will hang up and listen to the answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. He, he's saying that yes. the people at home are, are starting to include Jesus and Mary in that mm -hmm. long litany of, of gods. In a sense, maybe we can, you can draw their attention to those two. But his first question had to do with uh, the, this growth of the New Age aspect of Hinduism and your thoughts on that. Yeah, I don't know a whole lot about this New Age aspect uh, uh, about Hinduism, um, and that's growing. Yeah. It is unfortunate that that's happening, though. Yeah. Um, See, that's, that's in a way what I meant by the Americanized version mm -hmm. of Hinduism. I'm, I'm wondering if the Hinduism that many Americans encounter isn't really pure <coughs> Hinduism. It's an Americanized self-centered, right. self-focused, really new age movement in which it is a deification of self in this connection with mm -hmm. this other, which mm -hmm. involves an emptying of self, you know, which is really is kind of a combination between Buddhism and Hinduism right. and new age and this American right. version of these things. And uh, sadly, I'm wondering if there are very many Americans that actually get encountered with Hinduism at its source, uh, and that makes it hard for us to know how to reach out mm -hmm. to you. The Hindus That's right. in their faith. Well, you've been a Catholic now for uh, ten for, years. For ten years. Well, as a Catholic, uh, talk to us maybe in summary about Jesus. Okay, finding him as Lord and Savior. Well, as a Catholic, by reading the gospel and daily efforts of living the gospel. That's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. It is stated in Romans 6.23 that um, uh, uh, the Are you in the passage about the uh, eating right. my body and drinking my blood? No, the oh. Romans 6.23, the uh, wages of sin is oh, death, yes, of course, sir. Yes. but the gift of God is eternal life to Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's what I focus on. Mm -hmm. Our Lord has told us that you know not the hour, nor the day. However, as a follower of Jesus, I know that as the time runs out, I'm going closer and closer to the hour and the day when I will pass from this life into the eternal life. And therefore, I continue to frequent the sacraments of reconciliation and the Eucharist hmm. and live, do daily efforts to live the gospel, hmm. be an example to my children, to my wife and to as many people I can reach out to. And when children frequent these sacraments, when my wife frequents these sacraments and the people in the community frequent these sacraments too. We have that confidence. We, we know that, that the eternal life comes from Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So we all can say together that we believe that we shall see the bounty of the Lord in the land of the living. When we all can say that with confidence, that is eternal life. Mm -hmm. That is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is love of God. That is fellowship of the Holy Spirit. All right. Thank you, Sir Hank, for that wonderful witness to the gospel. 
and for sharing your journey into the, into the church with us. Thank you. God bless you. to be here. Thank you. Thank you, and, and stay with us. We'll be back in a moment with some final words for the journey home. number of things that I think Sarang reminded us of that we should never take for granted. And of course, that's our, our faith in Jesus Christ. He uh, re also reminded me in, in his story when he talked about that evening at home when he had been visiting the church and helping out in the church and hearing more and more about the church for a number of years, getting closer and closer and closer, but yet, yet ready to take that final step until the sister uh, had the, had the courage to confront him face to face and said, all right, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Uh, a, way of calling, a way of stating that is she closed the sale on him. She made sure that with all that he was learning that he took it seriously and knew that this is a decision he had to make in his life. And he had heard that from priests and others in the church, but a friend said, all right, what do you think? And Jesus calls us to do that and never take it for granted. John wrote in 1 John these very powerful words. In chapter 5, John wrote, This is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son of God has not life. It's very clear. Eternal life is in Jesus. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? All the things that are in the church... In our culture, there's importance to them, but their true importance is in their relationship to Jesus. So what is your relationship to him? That's the important step on the journey home. God bless. I'll see you again next week.